We live in a community. Whether you want it to be whatever neighborhood you happen to be in, or Auckland, or New Zealand, or the world. But we're part of a community. And as part of this formulation of this community, we've come up with, we've established a number of rules, a number of norms, and a number of duties that we agreed to abide by. We are consenting to this form of government that establishes a number of rules, norms of behavior, a number of duties, and for transgressions, violations, breaches of those duties, there are consequences. And this is where the criminal justice system comes in. Harm, defense, immorality. What are some of the complexities? Some groups of people might consider it to be harmful, whereas others might not because of cultural differences. Okay, so there's a cultural difference as to whether or not the act itself is harmful. There are different <coughs> types of harm. Different types of harm. We've got social harm, material harm, physical harm, emotional harm, reputation. Let's deal with the easiest one first. All right, so all acts that cause physical harm are prohibited. Does the harm need to be long-lasting? Does it need to leave a scar? So it becomes a little more complex. The point simply is that when we're trying to decide which acts to criminalize, when we're using the social harm category, and ultimately there are political choices that are made. Acts that cause offense. What about public passing? What about public passing of two people of the same sex? Sometimes it shifts our attitude. So offense is also a complex category. And all acts deemed immoral are prohibited. What's the obvious response to that? Morals. morals. Whose morals are we applying? Whose morals? <coughs> These three categories have given rise to four approaches when it comes to defining crime. Any act that is criminalized by the legislature what is the obvious flaw? So how do you determine which ones you're going to criminalize? We say crimes are acts or omissions that lead to some type of harm, usually these types. As we said, this is complicated as well, because how do you determine which harm merits protection against? So we say there are some acts out there that are condemned by all. They're universally condemnable. Murder, an obvious one. But even that falls apart pretty quickly. What about the death penalty? What about killing in times of war? Is that something that's permissible? All violations of human rights are crimes. But the human rights approach quickly falls apart as well. Within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we see that everyone has a right to food, to housing, work, healthcare, education. At that point, it becomes a little more complicated because a lot of people don't necessarily want to pay for someone else's housing. So even human rights approach falls apart, which is why we have to draw upon all of these different approaches in trying to craft a crimes act. Society, at the end of the day, is determining which behaviors we deem criminal and which we do not. So there is no hardcore category of criminal behavior. So even when you take something as straightforward as murder, that one quickly unravels as soon as you place it in a particular situation. So the recognition of crime is socially defined. What this means is that if crime is socially defined, a different social, a different political climate will bring about legal change. So as society changes, our definition of what is criminal and what is not changes as well. The media today is by far the most important institution in determining what we regard as criminal and what we do not. The media tend to focus on street crime, random violence, muggings, rape, 
murder. And these are random acts of violence. And the implication when the media focuses on these random acts of violence is that because of their randomness, this could happen to you. That produces what feelings? Yeah. Fear. Fear. Random street crime only occupies a very small percentage of criminal activity in New Zealand. What police officers spend more time dealing with? Domestic violence, alcohol-related incidents, tax fraud, embezzlement, and violations of workplace health and safety. And you see that there's a market drop between 2009 and 2010 looked at the various newspapers to see how they were reporting on the drop in crime, and they weren't. What they also failed to report, and this is what is most interesting, I find, is that since the 1990s, this number has been steadily declining, since the 1990s. So occasionally what you have are these spikes, and those tend to be what the media focuses on. Does this mean necessarily that New Zealand is becoming a safer society? Not necessarily. We're looking at a list of acts that have been reported. These numbers, I'm presenting these numbers to you because I'm trying to convey a message to you. That, hey look, crime is on the way down. Even though media tells you that crime is on the way up. But I'm simply manipulating the numbers. Because I'm only showing you 2009 and 2010. And I'm also only showing you recorded crime. My point is that how things are represented will influence how you feel about a given topic. You need to actually think about these rather than get taken up by the frenzy that the media creates. This is from a report that was put out by the Ministry of Justice. In understanding criminal occurrence, you cannot simply look to the crime itself what you have to look to are the contexts of crime and victimization. And we have to look at the individual, and sex, and age, and ethnicity, and literacy, and mental and physical health, and labor market engagement. Does this person have a job or not? Does this person have the potential of getting a job? Does this person have an education? Can this person read? Then we look to family. What kind of a family do they live in? What kind of a support? What kind of support do they enjoy? And then we look at society. What neighborhood do they, have they grown up in? If you grew up in Mangarei, chances are you had a very different childhood from growing up in Koimanama. Is that going to influence your outlook on life? Well, yes, inevitably it is. And the Ministry of Justice recognizes this. Economic conditions. Are you poor? Are you middle class? Are you wealthy? That is likely to influence your outlook on life and your behavior. Social cohesion, globalization, and consumerism. Imagine that. The problem is that many of these crime is dealt with in a very simplistic fashion in society today. So we look at the individual, we look at the victim, and we determine the sentence. So we're operating purely within a retributive model. But the point is, if you actually want to achieve wider outcomes, we need to move beyond a simple retributive model and look at a reformative model and look at a restorative model. And maybe in dealing with criminal activity, we should look at education. Why? There is a direct correlation between criminal activity and level of education. A direct correlation. So, the more educated people are, the less likely they are to engage in crime. So, what some societies, such as the Scandinavian countries, have done as a way to reduce crime has been to make education more accessible. That has been their approach. Their criminal justice approach? Build more schools. So not build more prisons, build more schools. The strategy differs because of the perception, how we perceive the behavior. In Sweden, we're looking at it as a context of society. This is a consequence of this person's social conditions. 
In New Zealand, we tend to focus on individual behavior. What I'm simply saying is that to understand criminality, to understand behavior that transgresses the norms and rules that we all allegedly agreed to, we have to look at things in a more, from a more nuanced angle. It's not enough to take a simplistic approach of more prisons, of longer sentences, harsher punishments.